Welcome to the lecture by Honorable Sri Justice Sripati Ravindra Bhatt, former judge, Supreme Court of India, organized under the auspices of Kerala Judicial Academy and Indian Law Institute, Kerala State Unit. May I invite the Honorable Dignitaries onto the dais. I invite Honorable Sri Justice Sripati Ravindra Bhatt, former judge, Supreme Court of India, Honorable Sri Justice Ashish J. Deshai, Honorable Chief Justice, High Court of Kerala, Honorable Dr. Justice A.K. Jashangaran Nambiar, Executive Chairman, Indian Law Institute, Kerala State Unit, and President, Board of Governors, Kerala Judicial Academy, and Sri K.N. Sujit, District and Sessions Judge, Director, Kerala Judicial Academy, onto the dais. I invite Honorable Dr. Justice A.K. Jayashankaran Nambia for the introductory address. Chief Guest of the Day, Justice Sripati Ravindra Bhatt, former Judge, Supreme Court of India, Chief Justice Ashish J. Desai, my esteemed colleagues on the bench, former judges of this court, judicial officers from the district judiciary, senior advocates, members of the legal fraternity, Registrar General and other officers of the High Court, Sri Sujit, Director, Kerala Judicial Academy, members of the Indian Law Institute, advocate clerks, law students, ladies and gentlemen. The adoption of the Constitution in 1950 was a landmark moment in the Indian history as it symbolized the triumph of democracy over colonial oppression and laid the groundwork for a just and inclusive society. The Constitution provided a framework for governance, delineated the separation of powers, and enshrined the fundamental rights, serving as a bulwark against the potential use of abuse of authority. In that sense, our Constitution was envisaged as a transformative Constitution, although the transformation was to be in a phased manner and through an incremental empowerment of our citizenry. Incidentally, this was also the vision of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, who was the head of the committee that drafted our constitution and whose death anniversary we observe today. 76 years after independence, our constitution and our laws continue to be influenced by our colonial past. The topic for today's lecture by our esteemed chief guest, shedding the colonial hangover, perspectives on Indianizing the legal system deals with this issue. The topic has been a bone of contention for decades with some of the finest legal minds voicing the difficulties being faced in the present legal system due to its colonial residue. Having said that, India's constitution stands as a testament to the resilience and determination of a nation that emerged from the shadows of colonialism. Its evolution over the years reflects a commitment to democratic ideals and the pursuit of a just and egalitarian society. As India continues to progress, the constitutional framework remains a guiding force, ensuring that the country's growth is rooted in the principles of justice, liberty, and equality. With that brief introduction of the topic, let me get on to my task of welcoming the chief guest of today's event, Justice Sripati Ravindra Bhatt. During his illustrious period as a judge, which included four years as a judge of the Supreme Court, he has authored and presided over landmark judgments concerning various subjects of law, which have contributed immensely to the ever-evolving legal fabric of the country. I don't really need to do this job of introducing Justice but I think he's, qu he's quite a familiar face in Cochin, and uh, even more familiar now with the visual media uh, and the social media uh, rife with all his photographs. Some of the Important judgments of recent times includes the judgment in Supriya Chakravarti concerning the right to marriage of same-sex couples, Dr. Balram versus Union of India, which dealt with the barriers of the POXO Act, and of course the Janhit Abhiyan versus Union of India, which dealt with the reservation for the economically weaker sections. On behalf of the Kerala Judicial Academy and the Indian Law Institute, I extend to you, sir, a warm, very warm welcome.
a handsome and dashing chief justice ashish desai <coughs> is the patron of the kerala judicial academy and the president of the indian law institute within a short span of time his lordship has captured the hearts of all in the legal fraternity in kerala i welcome you chief to this function i also welcome all my esteemed colleagues on the bench the former judges of this court i see justice sri jagan and justice ramakrishnan already um, uh, i don't think i'm seeing any other uh, the advocate general sri k gobalesh group my good friend the director general shaji uh, sri saibi jos kidangur president of the kerala high court advocate association sri navin secretary senior lawyers members of the legal fraternity judicial officers of the district judiciary registrar general other officers of the court adv advocate clerks students from the various law colleges i'm so happy to see a lot of them here uh, especially in this program that is organized by the judicial academy and the indian law institute and uh, generally i welcome all the distinguished persons present here i thank you all for responding to our invitation thank you i invite honorable sri justice ashish de deshai chief justice high court of kerala president in law institute kerala state unit and patron in chief kerala judicial academy for the presidential address honorable justice s ravindra bhat former judge supreme court of india brother dr justice ak jayashankar dambia president board of governors kerala judicial academy and executive chairman indian law institute kerala esteemed sister and brother judges respected former judges of this court respected senior advocates learned advocate general members of the bar beloved judicial officers registrar general and other registrars mr sujit director kerala judicial academy dear law students ladies and gentlemen good evening i am extremely happy to participate in this program jointly organized by the kerala judicial academy and the kerala state unit of indian law institute <coughs> today we have this with us honorable justice as ravindra bhat former judge supreme court of india to enlighten us on an important subject shedding the colonial hangover perspectives on indianizing the legal system i would like to begin my speech by quoting the remarks made by mr kangal hanumanthiya a member of constituent assembly who later became the first chief minister of united mysore state when the constituent assembly debates were drawing to a close on november 17 1949 i quote we wanted the music of veena or sitar but here we have the music of an england band in fact this memorable quote from the deliberation of our founding fathers was among the earliest parts of a persistent disclosure discourse in india that our polity administrative and judicial system are not indian enough as we all know the legacy of colonialism permits various facets of society and one of its enduring inspirants lies with the legal system in a country like india the british colonial rule left an indelible mark on the legal framework leading to a complex amalgamation of indigenous customs and foreign legal doctrines the ongoing endeavor to shed this colonial hangover and reassert indigenous values with the legal system has been a subject of significant discourse and contemplation the roots of indian's modern legal system can be traced back to the colonial area where british imposed laws were superimposed upon existing traditional legal structures the british introduced english common law statute and judicial principles that replace or coexisted with pre-existing system of justice while this brought this brought about certain reforms and structures it also created a hybrid legal system that often struggled to harmonize diverse culture and legal practices over the time the inherited legal framework has faced criticism on various reasons critics argue that it is largely disconnected from our indigenous customs tradition and societal values leading to 
a sense of alienation among the populace. The rigidity and complexity of the legal procedures, language and concepts are seen in impediments to access to justice, particular for the marginalized communities. While we consider the perspectives on Indianization, it can be seen that efforts to Indianize the legal system encompass a range of initiative and aim to reconcile indigenous legal tradition with the inherited colonial framework. One approach involves the reinterpretation of laws and legal principles, though the lens of Indian philosophy, ethics, and cultural norms. This involves a re-evolution of legal concepts such as justice, equality, and rights in the Indian context. Moreover, some argue for a more inclusive and participatory legal process integrating local dispute resolution mechanism and customary practice with the formal legal system. This approach seeks to empower communities and enhance access to justice by recognizing and incorporating their customary laws and practice. It is quite worthwhile to note that in the recent years, there have been efforts to reform, indigenize the legal system. Towards this end, measures such as promoting alternative dispute resolution mechanism, translating laws into vernacular languages, and sensitizing legal professionals to diverse cultural perspective have been undertaken. Additionally, the promotion of legal education that incorporates the legal studies aims to bridge the gap between inherited legal doctrines and indigenous values. The quest to shed the colonial hangover with India's legal system is an ongoing journey marked by a complex interplay of historical legacies, cultural pluralism, and evolving social needs. The process of Indianization involves not only legal reforms, but also deeper reimagining justice, rights, and governance rooted in the rich tapestry of Indian traditions. As the nation moves forward, the harmonization of inherited legal principle with indigenous values remain a pivotal yet challenging task a testament to the dynamic nature of legal evolution in post-colonial society. Before concluding, on behalf of the High Court of Kerala, I express my sincere gratitude to Honorable Justice S. Ravindra Bhatt, the Supreme Court of India, for his Lordship lecture to be delivered now. The subject being deliberated is of utmost social relevance in the present day scenario, and I am sure that the talk will enlighten to all of those who are present here. Thank you all. I also thank Honorable Sri Justice Ashish Ji Deshai for the enlightening presidential address. Honorable Sri Justice Re Shripati Ravindra Bhatt is a paragon of legal excellence who vocally encourages an inquisitive approach, fierce independence, empathy, and compassion as hallmarks of both the bar and the bench. Justice S. Ravindra Bhatt was born in Mysuru and pursued his schooling at Kendriya Vidyalaya, Faridabad. Justice Bhatt completed his Bachelor of Arts honors in English at Hindu College, University of Delhi, then obtained his LLB degree from the Campus Law Center, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. After enrollment, within seven years of advocacy, he enrolled as an advocate on record. His practice mainly focused on public law, employment law, education law, and constitutional disputes. Justice Butt's remarkable reputation was further exalted when he was appointed as an additional judge of the Delhi High Court in 2004, where he served until 2019, before assuming the role of Chief Justice of the Rajasthan High Court and eventually being appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court in September 2019. Throughout these esteemed roles, Justice Butt has contributed immensely to the legal landscape of the nation. In 2009, while serving as a judge of the Delhi High Court, Justice Ravindra Butt dismissed an appeal filed by the Supreme Court itself, noting that all power, judicial power being no exception, is held accountable in a modern constitution. He single-handedly opened the office of the Chief Justice of India to the Right to Information Act, which decision was upheld by the Apex Court. During his tenure in the Supreme Court, Justice Butt played a pivotal role in significant benches tasked with sensitive issues, including the legality of same-sex marriages, custodial killings, investigations into police encounter killings, the validity of various reservations, the powers of a special investigation team, manual scavenging, reforms in criminal practice, and many others. 
Throughout his career, Justice Butt has reflected commitment and courage towards upholding the ideals of justice. Hardly a month ago, Justice Shripati Ravindra Butt retired from the Supreme Court of India after 19 illustrious years on the bench. But his superannuation definitely does not mark the end of his quest for justice, as he was recently appointed as Distinguished Professor at Dr. B. R. Ambedkar National Law University, Sonipat. And we keenly await the future endeavors of this legend. We shall not keep you away from the speaker of the day any longer. Please welcome our chief guest with a deserving round of applause. Good evening, Chief Justice Ashish Desai, Chief Justice of the Kerala High Court, Justice Dr. Jai Chankar Nambiar, Executive Chairman, Indian Law Institute, Kerala, the Kerala uh, uh, Judicial Academy, sitting and retired judges of the High Court, Sri K. and Sujit, Director, Judicial Academy, office bearers and members of the Indian Law Institute, Advocate General of Kerala, Law Officers of the State of Kerala, Advocates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Law Clerks, or what we call as Law Researchers in Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court, Students also, I believe. It gives me immense pleasure to be here in Kochi amongst you, thanks to the Kerala Judicial Academy, the Kerala State Branch of the Indian Law Institute and the High Court of Kerala for inviting me to deliver this lecture as a part of the Constitution Day celebrations. The topic chosen for today's lecture is interesting. We cannot truly understand what the colonial hangover in our legal system means until we also grapple with our unique legal history and the modes and manner in which our laws were codified and how our court systems were set up and what principles informed the functioning of early Indian courts. By early Indian courts, I clarify that how the early colonial systems function. Legal history is not limited to the jurisprudence built through adjudication of courts. It is far more multifaceted, and especially in India. It is informed by the forms of governance, how law and order was maintained, and the organization and distribution of power through centuries. The sources of this history are diverse and range from edicts, copper plate grants and palm leaf manuscripts to records of essential commodity laws, taxation methods and parameters, etc. A vast majority of our known legal history owes, owes an immense debt to rulers and administrators that prioritized meticulous record keeping, either through their own indigenous administrative setups or by extending support and being patrons of travelers and who came from far and near alike. Texts from the 18th century onwards are pivotal in tracing colonial legacies, legacies as well as departures in the modern legal system that was at the time being newly built. For instance, after the conquest of Bengal in 1764, the officials of the East India Company were confronted with the question of how to rule they were convinced that the distance between British and Indian society was too vast to bridge. So what did they do? They used religion as the key to understanding the latter. They built a legal system that drew heavily from religion. Initially, Brahmins and Maulavis were seen as authoritative lawgivers of Indian society and were incorporated into the new company courts. This followed by the systemic translation and compilation of Hindu and Muslim religious texts to serve as codes of law. Diverse and flexible traditions of religious and social life were frozen into regularities of a modern legal system. What I mean is we had different customs, different uh, ways and different practices given the diversity and immensity of India. But the attempt of the British was to collect them and freeze them or make them immutable. Brahminical and orthodox interpretations of scripture within the Indian society were granted the status of law. In many ways, by creating law in this manner, they were transforming the role of religion in social life as well as imprinting religious religion in the new legal system. 
This transformation of law and society were wide-ranging and significant, from property to family, from religion to labor. We continue to live with some of its consequences. Understanding how this came about has been the result of painstaking work of numerous historians who had the benefit of archives containing records not limited to court judgments, but also administrative documents and communications between officials in the East India Company. If you look at these types of sources, it gives us a far richer understanding of the intentions and actions of the times. Their work has since revealed that the story of modern Indian's legal system was the result of numerous accidental actions and ironic outcomes, a history which I will briefly trace by referring to just three individuals from the colonial legal and administrative setup. As I said, India posed a unique problem to the colonization campaign that the British had grown accustomed to. Unlike North America and the Caribbean, India had a language gap and several local and traditional and customary laws, resulting in the failed attempt by the British to impose their own laws. The British then turned to the Nawabs of Bengal to understand how an Indian state functions. They turned to the Nawab of Bengal because that is where they started from. Spearheaded by individuals within the British administration, the colonization strategy changed. There were renewed focus on Indian knowledge and experience, steeped in textual traditions. Three figures stand out in the in initial phase. Ironically enough, Warren Hastings was one such individual. He encouraged the study of Indian languages, traditions and systems to evolve an indigenous setup alongside a British sense of justice. His model was India as a theocracy. He focused on the ancient constitution by relying on 11 of the most revered pandits of Bengal. Just imagine re relying on 11 individuals to discern what the constitution of this great country is. To, and he compiled Shastric law for the use of the company's courts. His resulting code of gentoo laws or ordinances of the pandits covered the subject, uh, subject areas as wide as debt, inheritance, civil procedure, slavery, master-servant relationships, fines for damaging crops, the theft, duties of women, and so on. Uh, by the way, William Jones was an outstanding figure. He also established the Asiatic Society, and who I must, we, one must not undermine his efforts. He was a pioneer in many senses. He learnt uh, Sanskrit uh, under, under uh, a, a series of gurus uh, and he almost used to don, don Indian clothes when he was learning Sanskrit. And one of his enduring books, the collection, uh, I had the privilege of seeing what, he, what it is known as the Dharam Shastras. In five volumes, he translated them. I had the uh, privilege of seeing that rare, a rare a uh, copy of it in Mr. Venugopal's uh, collection on antiquarian books. The second outstanding figure was, uh, sorry, and now I come to William Jones, the co-founder of the Kish Asiatic Society, about whom I alluded, and judge of the Supreme Court of Calcutta, whose reliance on ancient texts was so severe that he refused to even trust Indian scholars in their translations. He created the digest of Hindu law on contracts and succession, to ensure that decisions were made according to Hindu law without any corruption by pandits and brahmins. He also translated Ma Man Manava Dharam Shastras. The third was Kolbrook, who is considered to be the first great Sanskrit scholar of Europe and was initially posted as a judge by the East India Company in Mirzapur. He developed a different conception of the nature and function of Hindu law. Much like Islamic law, Colbrook sought to divide Hindu law too into schools, Dayabhaga, Mitakshara, Banaras, Mithila, Maharashtra, and Dravidian. He tried to remove the religious portions in the Hindu text and instead focused on developing a civil code. Now, why is this? Because they were familiar with a certain way of handling their laws and looking at the laws and customs in the courts. So they came and superimposed thinking that we are doing this. You could call this accidental, you could call 
most of it design also. Similarly, with Islamic law, influential opinion and commentaries were translated rather than being seen as a way of life. These translation were, translations were ele elevated to rigid codes of law. This was only excavated by the creation of textbooks. Manoftan, for instance, compiled a number of fatwas with his own generalizations under the title Principles and Precedents of Mohammedan Law, which the English courts began to rely upon. This made Sharia law something it, is fundamental, it fundamentally had never had been, a fixed body of immutable rules beyond interpretation and discretion. So the very thing that India stood for, flexibility in our customary laws and assimilating latest practices which our society developed was in fact became something else in the hands of the British. Then we come to the era of common law. By the early 19th century, India's legal history reveals a new framework of disputes among the local and regional elite who used the new court systems to reinforce dominance and power. In many ways, it drew the, drew the lines more deeply between different social groups, landed gentry, merchants, etc., because it now played a role in all aspects of life, marriage, inheritance, production, labor, and land. There were now punishments for crimes against private property, which apparently was not so widespread, new rules of evidence, and codes of procedure that replaced the law. For instance, all depositions and examination of witnesses began, began to be transcribed and translated, and this text was originally binding rather than the oral testimony itself. By thinking that indigenous norms could be used in British institutions without compromising either, the result was that the plurality and diversity of our cultures were overridden. Valuable and important distinctions and very importantly, subtleties and nuance were ignored in the interest of an ostensibly homogeneous legal system. Therefore, when Hastings and Jones were committed to searching for an ancient Indian constitution in the process, ironically, they and more their successors, like Thomas Macaulay, turned customary law on its head and achieved what they sought to avoid English laws as laws of India. Their search for indigenous law led to its appropriation, transformation, and the elevation of these textual aspects over customary law, and finally, it is its rigid codification. The colonial project of lawmaking, in effect, delinked the people from their own indigenous roots through the importation of common law and the introduction and spread of English as a common language. Customs followed by tribal communities were overlooked and a lot of areas of law which were not codified were codified and the common law methods were applied universally. The courts began to categorize and use analogies with the adoption of precedents. British judges were able to do this because schools of diverse thoughts were universalized through so-called experts, the authenticity of whom itself was questionable. Now, coming to the main topic, what is meant by decolonization? On your being asked to speak on Indianization or decolonization, I want to first pose a question. Whether categories of what is Indian or foreign or colonial or indigenous or Western or Eastern exist in such neat silos. Are they amenable to workable definitions which can be translated into practice? What is truly Indian? An Indian method is perhaps is one of the most complex inquiries in the country as diverse as ours. How do we eschew a definition of Indian which excludes people that is cribbed, cabined and confined by narrow parochial considerations of re region, religion, languages and culture? Our constitution is a living document it is a living document which cannot be but be our answer to what is Indian. While it is no doubt true that the document itself is a mosaic of differently cur curated ideas from across the globe, that by itself does not lend itself to the criticism that it is un-Indian. 
while its colonial origins more specifically its reliance on the governance structure erected by the government india act has been criticized such critics are best in my opinion myopic the constitution was a product of its times it was conceived to put into action during a violent partition an abrupt colonial exit and most importantly against the backdrop of a challenging integration of princely states and federating units if you look at the initial concern and the initial ideas of the constituent assembly members in the first phase when the debates began they were not wanting a strong center they were wanting a different kind of union but then in the in the wake of partition and the violent aftermath there was almost a unanimous resolve that we must have a strong center that did not necessarily mean that the states should be weak the states were to reflect the genius of the people and the various regions the languages and cultures that to reflect them and their aspirations a simplistic critique based on textual borrowing whether neither appreciates the ethos of our freedom struggle nor does it do justice to some of the revolutionary ideas that were imprinted in the constitution some of these are truly indian according to me for they are not some colonial vestige they were unheard of at the times so the constitution was conceived and enacted and they they constitute truly indian constitutional ideas the first of the ideas is the immediate adoption by the constitution of a universal adult franchise model this was certainly a constitutional moment which which with one stroke guaranteed to all citizens equal participation in the democratic process the second is the horizontal application of fundamental rights and if i may use the term i have used it once or twice in some of my judgments the emancipation code in the constitution while a bill of rights was not a novel idea but the contents of part 3 especially in article 15 in article 17 and 23 and 24 was unknown and perhaps is still unknown maybe barring south africa in the free world these provisions demonstrated our commitment towards a revolutionary idea of equality which was not formal or legalistic in legalistic in its conception but was genuine social engineering it was not just a break from our past that was so, sought to be achieved but also a break from our feudal past so when we went for freedom it was not only against an external ruler but also against the internal forces that kept us constrained a large section of our population constrained forever or for long times the third is the creation of institutions the public service commissions the controller of general auditor general and most importantly and i think we must not celebrate this uh, any amount of celebration is less the election commission where in the world do we have an election commission as strong and as functioning as this the united states with its 200 year old history every come every election from 2000 at least two or three elections have been very fractious the results contested and we even have the specter of the present uh, contest being very very vi not violent as much as very very contentious and dividing the country we don't have that our our system is so beautifully devised if i might say so i would never say that any system is perfect we can always strive for better times and perfection but we were able to curate all the experiences and come out with this idea of a centralized election commission which would st truly stand apart and the judicial judici the judicial legal uh, partnership if i may say so which has empowered the election commission to virtually act as the entire state during the election is a unique uh, experiment if you look at our neighbors around us whether it immediate neighbors in south asia or other places i don't think we we can come across any example like this or even for that matter across the world so the fourth is article 32 of the constitution which textually confined to the supreme court 
is reflective of the nature of judicial power to be consecrated in all our courts and it speaks volumes of the concept of access to justice. This constitution was not a continuum of colonial rule. It was not just another legal reform. It signified a complete break from both external and internal structures, which were often oppressive. It signified the transformation of what were subjects to citizens, as one author aptly described, that an idea that forms the nucleus of the in vogue grammar of transformative constitutionalism. I cannot emphasize this idea enough. It ought to be reiterated and retold. It ought to be repeated just like the, a refrain in a ballad or in a bhajan. It needs reiteration because the state exists for the citizen, not the citizen for the state. The citizen is the right bearer and not the state. The state has duty to secure and facilitate development of the citizen and not vice versa. Only a right bearing citizen can assert her dignity, her claim for equality, her right to livelihood, her right to develop her capabilities and her right to assert herself in governance. Swaraj is not compatible with an overwhelming state. Swaraj cannot be attained by reversing the right duty dynamic and by demanding that citizens pledge duties to the state, which is what Soviet Russia did. Are we to go to that? Yes, we have to, I'll come to that part, that what are the vestiges of colonialism which we have to dismantle? Swaraj respects every citizen's right and therefore a duty is owed by a citizen to a fellow citizen in respect of the dignity and inherent worth of her fellow citizens, a duty which is embedded in the preambular idea of fraternity. It is this Indian, or what we can now call as the Bharati understanding of the citizen-state relationship, one that is inspired by our freedom struggle, one that is informed by the collective memories and experience of our suppressed masses. In contemporary discourse, other ways of thinking about decolonization are that there is a core distinction between decolonization in the international sense of the term, ousting a colonial power to replace it with indigenous governance and independent state sovereignty. Decoloniality, which we are concerned with, is an ongoing project that focuses on identifying colonial leg legacies that prevail even after a state has achieved independence. In its governance institutions, in its social setup, in its prevailing laws. It is a project of deconstructing these legacies and their far-reaching impacts. This involves conscious thinking through with foresight and intentionality in doing away with provisions and laws that were specifically, enact, specifically enacted to strengthen autocratic control and replacing them with provisions better suited to Indian society, economy and polity. The other view is that is to aggressively purge anything non-Indian and put focus instead on returning to the strengths and native genius of ancient Indian traditions and culture. This view needs deeper critical thought and inquiry. This view ignores the remarkably Indian feature of the constitution in its approach to social equality and egalitarianism. A common viewpoint in certain histories of the Indian subcontinent is the singular association of India with casteism and sexism. It was felt that the benevolence of colonialism, these historical viewpoints add, was to help India shed these practices. Without denying the presence of these practices, what I want to, hi want to highlight as distinctly Indian is how our constitution envisaged affirmative action and measures which I mentioned earlier, like Article 15, 15, 3 especially, 16 and 17 as the distinguishing char characteristic of Indian constitutionalism. What sets us apart our constitutional project from that of the United States or the Commonwealth countries is that we became, uh, with, uh, which also became the study and emulation in South Africa to some extent, is the foregrounding of the idea of egalitarianism, distributive justice. The South African constitution has a chapter called socio-economic rights. 
and its constitutional courts have tried to and enforced it in many judgments. We are all familiar with ideas of equality, reservation, etc. And this is where I want you all to ponder. But often ignored is the complete, and if one may say so, the revolutionary changes which has our society has undergone, not only socially but economically through distributive, distributive mechanisms like land reforms, land sealing, and other tenancy laws which sought to rebalance power equations and other laws and policies aimed at welfare and social justice, such as labor laws, all of which ensured a measure, measure of fairness. Uh, I will talk about Kerala in the end, but then I can't uh, resist the temptation of saying that I think this state more than any other with whom I proudly associate bears, shows a beacon to the rest of the country in many of these measures, especially in land reforms and the way social, society itself has been transformed. I have seen it. No, I'm not very old, but I have seen in my village, in, in my, which is not one of the very forward, so-called forward areas of uh, Kerala, which was not considered. And yet, that transformation has happened at the grassroots level, and, the, and you can see that the society has changed immensely because of these policies and laws, some of which is, of course, con controversial, and it has never come painlessly. Every, each one of these laws has caused uh, disruption. At the same time, the gains have been immense. The project of decolonization cannot realistically substitute one system for another which is readily available. The legal system and all any body of laws cannot be switched off and a new one switched on without causing untold hardship, hardship to the populace. Legal systems are always a work in progress, learning, unlearning and evolving over time to suit the changing needs of society. The pace of these changes is even more pronounced in a rapidly developing society like India. We know that our nation has never been a homogeneous entity. It is an ancient palimpsest on which layer upon layer of thought and reverie has been inscribed, and yet no succeeding layer has completely hidden or erased what has been written previously. This means that our ancient traditions and cultures are, are not one syncretic whole. There could be strands of, of, of commonality we cannot, on any reasonable grounding, point to one system of thought or one legal system that must replace the visible and invisible vestiges of colonial rules, rule that are omnipresent. In the light of all this, I would suggest that we should think about framing our constitution as the starting point to a renovative, indigenous way of governance and reconstituting our nation. Decolonization as an ongoing project then should be about acknowledging the complex history of our legal system, identifying the kind of rules and laws that give the greatest voice to the high principles of the Constitution. How can we reimagine re -imagine our laws and the manner in which we interpret and adjudicate ex existing laws to make them more compatible with our goals and status as a modern democracy? The idea is neither erase nor restore but to creatively interpret and incrementally reform our system to make it more just, more democratic, more accountable, and more accessible to those who most need it. Another I thing is that the blind rejection of a constitution on grounds that it was a modification of the Government of India Act is not the most thoughtful critique. India was and remains a truly plural society with diverse traditions, microcultures, languages, belief systems, and indeed legal systems, personal laws and cultural societal norms. In Kerala itself, we have several customs. If you go to the northeast, east, each state, we have seven states, each state may have diverse customs. You go to large states like Rajasthan and perhaps Gujarat, with its large tribal populations, we have different customs. Now, how do you homogenize them into one, what we call as Indian uh, system? 
uh, I, I am not saying it is impossible. We have to find out what is common, what is best, and devise something which is which is mutual, which is assimilative and yet yet allows these systems to breathe rather than to eliminate them. It is in this context that our constitutional commitments and ideas are transformational and therefore immeasurably valuable. They continue to be relevant and should not be dismissed simply, simply on the grounds that the constituent assembly was not comprehensively representative or that the document itself historically superseded colonial legislations and therefore has some vestiges of colonialism. A constitutional culture ensures that there is a regular obedience to the norms, a renewed pledge to its values, a constant awakening as, to, as regards the text, context, perspective, purpose, and the rule of law. Professor Umpendra Bakshi says, awakening is a constant process. Renaissance has a beginning but knows no end because everyday fidelity, fidelity to the vision spirit and letter of the constitution is the supreme obligation of all constitutional beings. One ought to witness in daily decisions an acceptance of these obligations. The debate around formal Indianization or decolonization ignores the fact that urgent attention is required to examine the various aspects of the legal system, including the problems litigants face, lacunae in providing adequate legal aid, pendency of cases, training and sensitization of police forces, prison reforms, or in general, the efficiency and effectiveness of the system. We must be careful not to fall back upon unequal, discriminatory, or uncertain legal draftsmanship. Our system of pecuniary jurisdiction where disputes are categorized by their money value is nothing but a continuation of the colonial practice of higher value disputes being adjudicated by the then white judges and lower value being dis disputes being adjudicated by native judges. The East India Company created courts in Bengal and other areas thereafter to fast track commercial disputes, an idea that we seem to have vigorously followed. Surely we need to rethink of our institutional choices. Prioritization of judicial talent and resources must surely rest on firmer constitutional footing than the money value of disputes especially so when legal resources are limited and liberties of thousands incarcerated in jail involved. The second area is tribunalization, another facet of the legal system which is deeply troubling from, from our national perspective. The most important public resources like electricity, the energy, energy, telecommunication, environment, airports, etc. are all hived off from constitutional courts. Access to these is restricted in terms of geographical access and resource person access. I say national perspective because a true constitutional purpose, uh, perspective would not sustain such amputation. I call this amputation. If you take away jurisdiction from the high court or the regular court, you have amputed the legal system, handed it over, yes, partly to judges, but the entire tribunal is not comprised of judges. And of late, I'm sorry to say, for the past five, six years, many of these tribunals have become defunct. And we are seeing a, almost a slow death. While judicial res resources are prioritized for the more affluent sections, the answer to huge backlog of cases and the not so affluent cannot be alternated disputed resolution. I'm not, not opposed to ADR. In fact, I've entered into a part of ADR, which, but which uh, um, again, I regret to say, uh, the most affluent sections of the society would be accessing, which is arbitration. But it, this is not to say that ADR should not be practiced. It can work wonders and also be effective. The adversarial system that we have inherited is definitely time consuming. However, that cannot imply that valuable rights of the poorer people must remain unadjudicated and pushed out of the system using the ADR methods. This is not Indian. This is neocolonialism because this is what they do is usually in the US. They, they would try to push everything out of the courts and retain only perhaps the criminal law which cannot be sent to the ADR mechanism. 
The same applies to plea bargaining. The Indianization I propose is allocation of judicial time and resources based on a right-based evaluation of disputes and not on class-based evaluation. Similarly, the push for ADR also, ADR also ought to be based on the nature of legal rights involved and not on the basis of value of the disputes involved. Uh, our legal attire dates back to the to as far as the reign of King Edward III in the 14th century. In this period, fur and silk, silk lined robes were established as a mark of high judicial office. This was based on the correct dress for addressing, attending and addressing the royal court of the day. These gowns changed with the seasons, generally green in summer and violet in winter with red, or red for special occasions. The plain back black gown was adopted in 1685 as a result of the bar going into mourning over the death of King Charles I. And we continue to be in perpetual mourning. I am confident that all of us can deliberate and adopt it, an attire that is more suited to the climatic and social conditions of this country. Not this. Maybe this. Certainly that. So this could be uh, definitely uh, uh, an improvement given our weather conditions. I am confident that we can deliberate an attire that is not capable of reflecting opulence, but at the same time is dignified enough to conduct court proceedings. Then comes the issue of language. There is no iota of doubt that adoption of English, English, Indian languages would not be just more equitable, but also increase access to justice. At the same time, you cannot abruptly abandon English and start with Indian languages. We cannot ignore that today we live in a global village. Our economic vibrancy and exponential growth in software and digital economy is in part due to the technical competence that we develop through institutions of excellence and the proficiency of our engineers and scientists in English. One can justly add this to the fact that today our legal experts and academics have found remarkable acceptance in international institutions, be it in the field of trade or taxation or other branches of commercial law. All this is made possible only if we excel in that language. Of course, we have to make, it, make sure that all of us, and I think those who, especially I consider myself to be unfortunate because I, the only modern Indian language which I know and I can speak and write is neither my mother tongue, nor my mother's mother tongue, nor my father's mother tongue. It is Hindi. At least it's an Indian language. But I'm afraid that doesn't apply to many of our children uh, who don't, who may converse in the language that we converse in, but they will not be familiar in, uh, they may not be literate. And that is also killing our uh, vernacular, our, our rich traditions and our cultures, linguistic cultures. Legal education, I would propose, must be first started in legal, in regional languages so that legal competency can be developed for professionals in these languages. This will require a recasting of curriculum and also ensuring that all relevant legal literature and best commentaries are available. This must be followed by an attempt to simplify, this is very important, and demystify our legal codes in terms of the language employed. Even in English, we must do away with all those heretofore, way to four, and for which act, act of kindness uh, uh, your petitioner shall forever crave, etc. This, this, this is not suitable to our constitution, just as your lordship is not. Along with this, there must be a sustained push for legal literacy for our citizens. This must start from reimagining our school curriculum and we must not be restricted to few camps that are organized for the purpose and pamphlets that, pu that are published. Then we have huge procedural delays. We are all too familiar with delays and reasons for me to develop into detail. We continue to follow a colonial template for procedures in our legal system, which was meant for a few hundred or at best a few thousand litigants. That's not the case today. Our Justice delivery system tends to lacks of cases. We need to systematically recast the procedural framework 
to keep in uh, the uh, to, to, to keeping in view the inequalities and hierarchies prevalent in our society our constitution says article 14 the first phrase equality before the law are we practicing that when a law, big lawyer comes what does the judge all of us and i i also plead guilty to that we defer do we give that equal treatment to all litigants through the lawyers we need to think rethink all this then there is one more thing we also need to unlearn the business as usual practices of endless applications adjournments and unlimited arguments having advanced into this 21st century with a new generation of judges we have to realize whether the court system where our functioning goes on in a particular manner should go on in the same manner we have to think as judges that 25 years later when when these law researchers and law students reach positions of seniority in the profession and become judges would they see courts in the same manner the same kind of courts or should we st start thinking of a different system of courts a different not only systems of address not only systems of dress but also how we function rationing our time limiting our pleadings and coming out with simpler judgments and uh, shorter judgments it is a challenge but we have to start the world around us has innovated and reinvented itself many times over our legal system sadly appear to be in a time wrap here i emphasize that mere enabling certain platforms would not be sufficient unless substantive reforms are needed at the same time procedural simplification or ease of getting justice cannot be at the cost of minimizing rights and justice so this balance is very necessary amartya sen made a distinction between nyaya and neeti he said two distinct words neeti and nyaya both of which stand for justice in classical sanskrit actually help us differentiate between two separate concentrations it is true of course that the words such as neeti and nyaya have been used in many different senses in different philosophical and legal discussions in ancient india but there is still a basic distinction between the respective concentration of neeti and nyaya among the principal uses of the term neeti are organizational propriety and behavioral correctness in contrast with neeti the term nyaya stands for a more comprehensive concept of realized justice in that line of vision the roles of institutions rules and organizations important as they are have to be assessed in the broader and more inclusive perspective of nyaya which is inescapably linked with the world that actually emerges not as just as an institution or the rules we happen to have a realization focused perspective makes it easy to see the importance of the prevention of manifest injustice in the world rather than focusing on the search for perfection as the example of matsyayana make it clear the subject of justice is not merely about trying to achieve it or dreaming about achieving some perfectly say some some perfectly just society or social arrangements about preventing but about preventing manifestly severe injustice do kerala is small its people have large hearts and its contribution to the growth of constitutional law disproportionate to its size it is a pioneer in so many areas human development index control of population and the tradition of harmony i am proud to belong to a district from which ak gopalan mk nambiar kk venugopal and keshwanand bharti all belonged speaking of the kerala of kerala today i cannot conclude a speech on this topic without making reference to so many of the giants that this state has produced and was home to dakshayani valayudam who spoke passionately against caste hierarchies 
and despite being a woman opposed reservations, Anna Chandy, a trailblazer in multifarious ways, the first feminist writer, lawyer to become a judge, and the first woman to become a superior court judge in the Commonwealth, Krishnayar, K.K. Matthew, and countless others. Thank you for inviting me and bearing with me all this while. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that inf insightful address on the topic, Shedding the Colonial Hangover, Perspectives on Indianizing the Legal System. We will now, the floor is now open for questions from the audience. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, so you mentioned uh, having a rights-based system over a class-based system. I'd just like to understand how we would put that in play in a country as diverse as ours. If you could just elaborate a bit on that, please. What I meant in that was that uh, we have for long had different uh, social hierarchies. So class and uh, in that sense social, social class and econom econom economic uh, status also overlap and intersect. So minimum what the constitution actually guarantees to us is equality in treatment. And through certain provisions like Article 15, 3, 15, 4, and now 15, uh, 5, and 15, 6, enables empowerment. It may be controversial, but that's the way we have taken. And perhaps we have achieved some kind of equality, and we might have a long way to go. But that is the way we have tried to dismantle class. Now, this kind of effort, I contrasted with the American or the other uh, constitutions, the older constitutions, where there was no attempt to restructure society. So if you look at the way our constitution was designed, it was through uh, enforceable rights and also casting duties on the state to do justice to the people through part four. That is what I meant. Thank you, sir. I was looking forward to more questions, more interaction from Kerala. Um, so you spoke about the uh, uh, shedding the colonial hangover and Indianizing the legal system. I wanted to know your thoughts on, uh, you see, I, as the way I see it, the greatest departure from an Indian system is the rights-based legal system which was imposed on us by the, by the British. If you look at the ancient Indian legal system, we had the Brahmanical code, uh, which was founded on the concept of, you know, family as a unit, elders, showing respect to elders, and generally the concept of dharma. Now, sadly, when we enacted our constitution, we did not have a chapter on fundamental duties, but we had something on fundamental rights. The Fundamental Duties chapter came 24 years later. Uh, my question is, how effectively are we using this chapter on Fundamental Duties when it comes to recognition of uh, duties in the state uh, for the purposes of implementing or guaranteeing the rights of individuals? The, this comes to, uh, this this brings us to a very important a very interesting question of fundamental duties how do we juxtapose these duties with rights there can be different ways of looking at it our fundamental rights are not absolute which means that the state in its legitimate role can impose restrictions the extent of the right is defined or rather is is uh, is, is limited to the extent of the uh, enforced, the, the, the valid laws. So which means that duties are to always follow the law, the restrictions that are followed which are valid. And how valid are they? Again, these are, there are no inflexible rules. If you look at the early judgments like V.G. Rao, what is reasonable today may not be reasonable 20 years later. And the extent of what is reasonable today may seem disproportionate 20 years later. Or what is reasonable today was not reasonable earlier. So that itself defines the extent of our duties. You look at the other constitution, there is no concept of duty. So here 
I mean, there is no concept of restrictions. So one way of looking at our fundamental rights, especially when you come to the First Amendment, is the constitution makers and later the first parliament, which is also the constituent assembly, realized realize that the extent of the, con the fundamental rights uh, and the extent to which individuals can go can be harmful to society. So therefore, these restrictions which impose duties upon us to follow that, like they say that, I mean, you have studied in, in Cambridge, so they say that the liberty of an Englishman to swing his umbrella is confined, is only to the extent of the other man's nose. So the right is always conditioned upon a duty, even in the classical jurisprudential sense. Now, one more question, I would rather look at it from an yet another perspective. What is the duty that a newly born child owes to society? An infant. Now, when I come to this, I mean the right to life. What is the duty that is owed by a person to the state when he asserts his right to life? The state owes a duty. Therefore, what are the duties that the state can extract from a citizen? In that sense, we have reimagined a different state. Definitely, we are, our state is different from this, the concept of a Western state. Our, our concept of a sovereignty has been defi different. different. Our, our concept of governance is different. And at the same time, at a social level, our obligations to each other are different. So I, I think our constitution has maintained that essence. And in that sense, if you say that you have to impose duty in that sense of the dharma, perhaps it, it, it could be a, a way in for more state control. That, that's, the, that's the sense I have to the limited extent that I could see because there is always the rights, duties debate. But in the jurisprudential sense, there is no right which is absolute. There is always a duty. So here when we talk of rights, there are duties. Even an absolute right like under Article 30, the minority right, now it is subjected to so many restrictions and reasonable restrictions. The content of these reasonable restrictions is a matter of debate. Um, good evening, sir. Um, in your speech, you spoke about how the argument that the Constitution is just a modification of the um, Government of India Act 1935 is not a well-thought-out argument. Now, that argument has been the basis of two very contentious articles, a book. So could you deconstruct that argument for us a little bit more? See, as I said in that, uh, in that talk, this... Uh, uh, see, whether... We may have taken a template uh, that this is a bicameral legislative uh, bo body, parliament, with its different lists, etc. But it's not just the Government of India Act. You go to the US Constitution. They also have lists. What the state can in legislate, what the, the federal government, federal, uh, uh, say, uh, the, the federal Congress can uh, legislate. Then you go to the Australian, of course, it could be argued that Australia and Canada are colonial constitutions. But at the same time, Canada is more plural. They have the experience of different communities, especially linguistic. And they have got their own problems and they went into a re-engineering mode and yet these lists have been retained. And likewise, when you go to directive principles, we took it from the Irish constitution. Now, when, when we look at the fundamental rights chapter, when we look at the independent institutions that our constitution has created, as I said, election commission, the comptroller, auditor general, independent offices, and now you go into the new generation laws like laws of transparency on right to information. These are not, these are not colonial, these are entirely ours, and our, our genius has produced this. So we, we should be proud of these. If there, are, if there is a need for change, in uh, the structure of our governance, that too has been achieved. For instance, the panchayats. Now, we achieved through the panchayat, giving them a constitutional status by the 73rd and 74th Amendment. This is not to say that the constitution is inflexible, should be inflexible, and should never be changed. The, uh, we have witnessed no less than 103 amendments, maybe 104. So, which means that we are very prolific in our changing the constitution. Let's not go about changing our constitution saying this is old. That's, that's the only note of caution. Because talk of 
colonialism, uh, colonial past, of our, especially in the, uh, when we talk of a governance institution, a, a foundational document like Constitution of India, which was debated for almost three years. And uh, maybe it's people were not representative. Look at UN, United States, was it representative? Look at what it has achieved. Like I said, it has achieved adult suffrage. Look at where gender parity is today and what it was 75 years, 74 years ago. So therefore, let us look at the gains and then say what are the, what are the shortcomings and see that in a balance. And if those shortcomings need to be addressed, let us address them. So, uh, the topic says uh, on the uh, perspectives of the Indian, uh, uh, Indianizing the legal system. In this context, I would like to uh, refer to the, the global system. Uh, if you look at the Arbitration Act, or the NDPS Act, or the rights of women, rights of children, they were all for, uh, flow, um, flowed from the UN uh, conventions and a global thought, anything on the environment and uh, money laundering, all these have a global perspective. So uh, shouldn't we keep all our options open and wherever possible look at what is happening outside globally and then adapt, adopt uh, and adapt as, as is best suited for us. And uh, by, uh, the, the, uh, the, the core of what I want to say is that there is nothing, even perhaps you also referred to it, there is nothing really Indian. We have to probably search around what is really Indian is a big question mark. I would agree with you for the first part, but not the last. There are many things Indian, but uh, on the first part that we have to uh, keep pace with what is happening globally is very important because we are poised to become a very uh, a player, as we call it, uh, in terms of consumption, in terms of uh, ex exports, in terms of the size of our, eco our economy, we are a very important uh, power which cannot be ignored. So we have adap adopted and we are not shying away from those systems. We said an central mode of, for arbitration. Recently we have ratified the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Then we have, as you mentioned, a, a money laundering, the corruption uh, convention, children's rights, and a number of other international conventions and gone on to enact them as, as uh, our laws, as part of our laws, and those have also transformed our society. So in that sense, there cannot be a, a step backwards because these are two, we are, we are aligning ourselves with the world uh, economy, the world systems. So at that, when, at, if you start at that level, any going back from those or even our own systems which have aligned to that would mean sliding backward to something which is unknown. Uh, in that sense, you are right, it may not be advisable, especially when it comes to the economy, uh, laws concerning the economy, infrastructure and so on. Thank you everyone. Thank you for that engaging interactive session. May I now request our Honorable Chief Justice, Honorable Sri Justice Ashish J. Deshai, to present a memento to our guest of honor, Honorable Sri Justice Sripati Ravindra Bhatt, as a token of her gratitude and appreciation. I invite Sri K. N. Sujit, District and Sessions Judge and Director, Kerala Judicial Academy, for the concluding remarks. Honorable Mr. Justice Ashish Deje Shai, Chief Justice uh, High Court of Kerala, President, Indian Law Institute, Kerala State Unit, Patron in Chief, Kerala Judicial Academy, Honorable Dr. Justice A. K. J. Shankaran Nambiar, Judge High Court of Kerala, Executive Chairman, Indian Law Institute, Kerala State Unit, and President Board of Governors, Kerala Judicial Academy. Our uh, center of attraction of this memorable event, uh, Honorable Mr. Jesse Sribath Ravindra Bhatt, former judge, 
Supreme, Honorable Supreme Court of India, uh, enviable lineup of uh, Honorable sitting judges of Honorable High Court of Kerala, uh, most respected former judges of High Court of Kerala, uh, Advocate General, Director General of Prosecution, um, Government Law Officers, my dear officers, my dear law friends, my dearest law students, um, officials of the Kerala Judicial Academy, volunteers of Indian Law Institute, ladies and gentlemen. We all know the topic of topic which was selected for today's lecture is so huge. But we were gifted with a very memorable event, very memorable evening by an exceptional legal brain with a remarkable oratory skills. The way in which a lordship had presented the things. We, ha we, had we could get a lot of takeaway from the lecture which are delivered here. The main thing, we should have an introspection. We should have a honest reckoning from our side how we have pandied this colonial backlog. So, though the subject is such kind of in-depth, intrinsic worth and so intricate, your lordship has segregated it, simplified it, and then presented it in a very convincing manner. Your Lordship, you graciously consented to come over here and present a phenomenal speech before us. We are so grateful to you on behalf of all who gathered here, on behalf of Kerala Judicial Academy, on behalf of Indian Law Institute, I express my profound gratitude to your Lordship. Honorable Mr. Justice Asis De Jaisai, all of you know our Honorable Chief Justice. He also graciously consented to come over here to present a thoughtful uh, presidential address. So on behalf of all of you, I express our deepest gratitude, profound gratitude to our Honorable Chief Justice. Honorable Dr. Justice A.K.J. Sengaran Nambiar. Actually, His Lordship is the organizer of this event. He is the President of the Board of Governors of Kerala Judicial Academy and the Executive President of the Indian Law Institute State Unit. And when there is a collaborative event was suggested, it was accepted and consented, deliberated in the Board of Governors and finally resolved to conduct this event in this manner. Only for the sake of formality, I express our deepest gratitude to Honorable Dr. Justice A.K.J. Singhran Nambiar. As all of you know, we got an enviable lineup of Honorable Judges of our Court of Kerala. Though the evening, though tired, all of you turned up here to attend the function. We, on behalf of Kerala Judicial Academy and on behalf of Indian Law Institute, we express our profound gratitude to you also. Most respected uh, former judges of Honorable High Court of Kerala, they also turned up for this event. The, the enthusiasm they had shown is actually a celestial light for us also. We express our deepest gratitude to you also, your lordships. <laughs> Honorable Advocate General and Honorable Director General of Prosecution, both turn up for this function by accepting our institution. We express our great thanks to all of you. And then the law officers, you also turned up for this function. On behalf of Kerala Judicial Academy and on behalf of Indian Law Institute, we express our gratitude to you also. My dear officers, you also turned up for this function, making it over here by accepting our invita invi invitation. I on behalf of Kerala Judicial Academy and on behalf of Indian Law Institute, express, extend our big thank you to you. My dear law students, you are the biggest beneficiaries of the speech, phenomenal speech rendered here. Take everything that you had gathered from here and carry it home and you, it will be a guiding light for all of you. Your, my dear law students, you also tender for this function. We are extremely thankful to your presence also. 
the officials of the Kerala Judicial Academy, of volunteers of the Indian Law Institute, they all strove hard for the success of this function. We are extremely thankful to them also. In addition to that, all persons who had extended even a minutest help for the success of this program on behalf of the Academy, on behalf of Indian Law Institute, I express the deepest gratitude to them also. Thank you. Jai Hind. Kindly raise for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha Dravida utkala vanga Vindya himachala yamuna ganga Ujjala jaladhi taranga तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे